uh, COCO Conversations. Uh, my name is Martin Hall, and I am one of the editors of Corporation in Conflict. Today we will talk about Lena Hansen, Rebecca Adlon Nissen, and Katharine Emilis Andersen's recently published article, The Visual International Politics of European Refugee Crisis Tragedy, Humanitarianism, Borders. With me today, I have uh, uh, Lena Hansen. Uh, who is a professor of international relations at Copenhagen University and the project director of images of international images and international security. Here is also Rebecca Olonissen, who is also a professor of international relations at Copenhagen University and the primary investigator of the ERC project Diploface. Uh, we have also Rolla Blaker. Uh, who is a professor of international relations, peace and conflict studies, and political theory at the University of Queensland. Uh, and he will join us as our discussant today. Roland directs the cross-disciplinary <coughs> sorry, research program, Visual Politics. So I would like to thank uh, all three of you for so generously taking time off your busy schedules. And, and, and for joining me here today to discuss this uh, fascinating article. Before I hand the word over to, to, to you, Roland, I would like to ask Lena and, and, and Rebecca to, to start off question or initial questions. First, I think it would be really interesting to hear a bit about the, sort of the intellectual trajectory that brought you to research this, this, these topics. But what is the intellectual itinerary uh, that has this article as one stopover or, or one station? Sure. And, and second, um, would you say that there is a visual turn going on in, in, in IR? Um, and whether there is or not, uh, should there be one? And I assume that, that you think there should be one because that, that's what you're working on. And that's a simple answer, but so is there a more, is there a not so simple answer to the question of should there be a visual term? If you have any reflections or comments on that. Should I start off with the first yeah. question? Thank you so much, Martin, for inviting us to, to come and have uh, this conversation about the article. We're, we're very, and we're really delighted to get this chance and, and, and also to be able uh, to talk to you about it, Roland, who has written, it is in the most foundational text about visual politics and particularly also about, uh, about refugee politics. So, so we're, we're really honored uh, to be here. Um, I think for me, the sort of the trajectory to this article, I mean, this is both a longer uh, answer, uh, which is how I came to study, you know, visual representations in the first place. And uh, it, I had worked on discourse analysis for a number of years and, and sort of uh, felt that there was something to be said about the specific ways in which that images communicate. Um, but I hadn't quite gotten around to it when I was writing uh, a book on discourse analysis called Securities Practice, Discourse Analysis and the Boston War that came out in 2006. Uh, and at that time, then the, the controversial cartoons uh, that were published by Ulens Peston, the so-called Muhammad cartoons came out. Uh, and there was so much, uh, you know, securitization, diplomatic, uh, you know, conflicts and so on over those that that was sort of a push for me to, you know, really go into it and, and, and start to sort of discuss and theorize the specificity uh, of, of securitizations that came through the visual or that mobilized the visual. Um, then sort of fasting forward, this is the first uh, article where I have engaged with a larger number uh, of images. And I think there was sort of two uh, aspects to this. Uh, one is that I think uh, uh, most uh, analysis uh, in international relations on visual politics has focused on iconic images or a smaller number of images. Uh, and in the, the collaboration with Rebecca and Katrina, that was part of Images and International Security, we thought there was an interesting sort of intellectual challenge in terms of trying to you know, speak to a larger uh, number uh, of, of images. Uh, we've also, the three of us have published an article uh, that deals with the Alan Kurdi iconic image. Um, so this was sort of, a, in some ways, this is sort of a companion 
companion piece to that, uh, which is you know broadening out and 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 asking uh, asking that uh, that question. We were also I'd say you know directly uh, inspired by Roland Bleicher's article in the 2015 uh, special issue of Millennium, uh, where Roland is encouraging us to you know try as many different methods and approaches to images, uh, and also to combine things that we might not. It, it, you know, otherwise uh, have thought of. So this is actually it is actually a, an article that's uh, written in direct response to 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 Roland's work, uh, and it started out with Katrina, who is the third uh, author, uh, her master's thesis uh, that was a uh, a comparison between content analysis and visual discourse analysis uh, on a uh, on a smaller number uh, of of images. So. That I think was sort of the, the contextualization of the article in terms of you know my work, but also you know the role that it played uh, in the sub project that we had uh, dealing with the images of the European refugee crisis in the larger project. Yeah, uh, so it's been a it's been a, a, an interesting journey this this article has has had also in our in our minds I guess. Uh, so for me entering this uh, project. Uh, uh, and I guess you can see a little bit of, of both Lena and me and Katrina in this paper, in the sense that it's it's definitely also dealing with the relationship between decisions that are made um, at the highest political levels. Uh, so within the diplomatic engine rooms of the EU. So, so we were interested in, in this particular project in, in finding out that or addressing that big question, which is the relationship between images and and politics uh, more broadly, um, and uh, we can speak more about what we found. But I think just the trajectory is also, in a sense, a somewhat almost phenomenological question. Is and this also talks to the to the number of images that what is it we see when we what is the kind of visual landscape or environment within which we take decisions? And when I say we. I, I, I'm not only saying you and me in the Zoom room, but also, of course, at different levels of, of politics. And this question has been addressed in a number of different ways, but we found it at least not fully convincing uh, the way in which it was presented. So, so we wanted to sort of dig deeper into that visual landscape within which these extremely important and, and, and crucial decisions are made or not made, perhaps that's even more crucial. And, and, and to the visual turn, is that visual turn, should there be one? There definitely is. I think that's a beyond <laughs> question. Um, and and uh, we're in a room with, with some of the leading members of that turn, but whether we want to call it a turn or just an, an interest is perhaps, uh, I guess, less important. The notion of turn has this, um, idea that we're, we're, we keep on turning and there's been a, a huge criticism of the sort of navel gazing part of, of, of the use of turn, but the idea that the visual and images and aesthetics and more broadly culture uh, is something we, can, we can, can and should keep on paying attention to, I think is, is crucial. And it, it's not, I think Mike Williams put it really nicely. He's also a member of the of the images and security uh, team that Lena built. In a sense, if, if we talk about a visual turn, it would actually be a, a return, <laughs> he would almost say, because it has always been with us, um, the interest in aesthetics and the relationship between um, the emotions that those visuals might produce and the, and the political um, um, decisions and, and power um, that we make. And so it's been within the discipline of IR for a long time, but has perhaps not had the, the attention, uh, at least in, in, in recent decades, that it, it should have. So this goes way beyond the question of whether we live in a more visualized or visual culture right now and social media, because um, in the long term sort of trajectory, the visual has always been with us. I think also if I can add just to that, I think one of the things that I think is whether we call it a turn or not is is that I think focusing on the visual actually brings in a number of 
of themes into IR, like Rebecca was saying, you know, rereading of classical international relations theories through, you, you know, their engagement with aesthetic politics and the role that aesthetic representations that might foster in terms of, you know, generating, you know, support among the population or, you know, in more authoritarian ways, be a way to actually get, you know, populations to rally uh, behind their behind their leaders. And then there's also, you know, Roland uh, you know, set out with the aesthetic uh, turn in, in, in 2001, you know, in a very famous article. There's also, you know, part of, of the visual turn through the aesthetic turn, which is, you know, drawing our attention also to other forms of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. so, epistemological, uh, I, I think part of that, uh, which is very important. Uh, there's also, and again, you, you know, looking <laughs> looking to Roland's work, you know, your article Millennium in 2015, you know, underscoring the multiple epistemological and methodological ways that we can approach the visual, but also that is actually already, you, you know, being, being has been, you know, carried out in IR in the last 10 years. So there's also experiments. Mm -hmm. and, that come from a very different epistemological background that I have, you know, normally worked in, uh, which is looking at, you know, the, you know, the possibility of images to, you know, make people change their opinions on, you know, wars and so on. So I think this can actually also be, you know, it's, it's an interesting field because it enables, I think, conversations uh, between uh, parts of international relations that, you know, might not otherwise gather in the same, you know, set of panels at ISA, for example. Thank you. Uh, Roland, do you want to... Can I perhaps start by, by saying a big thanks to Martin and the team at Cooperation and Conflict for the chance uh, to be here, to join you in this conversation. It's, it's a great honor and, and pleasure for me. I've, I've read both Lenny and Rebecca's work for many, many years and my own research has been decisively shaped by their contributions in several fields, in security studies, in discourse analysis, European politics, and of course, in, in visual studies as well, in visual culture. So it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and part, be part of that conversation. I've also very much enjoyed reading and this morning rereading their article in, in cooperation and conflict on the visual, visual international politics of the European uh, refugee crisis. I've noted down at least about a dozen issues I'd love to, to talk about, and I don't think we'll, we'll have the time probably to go through all of them. And some of the issues have already come up in your kind of opening statements uh, around the visual framing of the crisis, around methods, around combining different types of methods. But I was wondering if you can perhaps start with uh, the topic of Alan Kurdi, uh, the, the three-year-old uh, Syrian refugees who was found dead and really sort of made, was photographed, made the news in Europe at that time. And of course, you have written a separate article on Alan Kurdi itself. But you do start off this present article as well with Alan Kurdi. And even though your focus is not on icons, I was wondering a little bit if you can maybe start off saying a few words about about the iconic power of that image and how it shaped it. In a sense that sort of traditional analysis, I think here of, of Hariman and Lukaitis have always argued that it would take about a decade for an icon to become iconic in a sense that it has to circulate around the world, it has to be known by everyone. But in this day and age, uh, the circulation of images has very much increased in speed and reach, so much so that perhaps an image can become iconic in a much, much faster kind of way. Hey, uh, did you want to say a few words about about how kind of the the, the political pho photograph and impact of Alan Kurdi has shaped your your research and the kind of the issues you look at? Uh, yeah, uh, just it, 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 it initially, um, it's true. We 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 started out with the with the with the Alan Kurdi uh, image or images because <laughs> there are many. Um, also because, um, because exactly of its iconic status and, and its almost immediate iconic status. And, and that was in, indeed a very striking phenomenon and some, something we might ascribe to the particular uh, media landscape we now are in, where it's possible uh, to circulate images at, at such a high speed and across the globe. So it's almost, um, uh, it's fascinating how much and how it keeps on resonating in 
political environments across the world. So it's not just a Western phenomenon, it's a global icon. And um, we, we wrote the, the article in, in Review of International Studies, focusing very much on this and also drawing on Lena's earlier work on, on iconic images and how they constitute a particular um, uh, emotional or appeals to a particular emotions. But what we also found, and I think this kind of lends it over to the cooperation conflict study, is that as much as it was iconic, it was also puzzling because we could see a, a, discontent, a disconnect and a constant questioning of what that image was supposed to do and what it was supposed to mean. So everyone agreed um, that this across the board, so leaders of the UK, uh, Obama, Germany, everyone, this was, a, this was a tragedy, this was something needed to be done. So this call for political action. And so you could stop there. But the thing is <laughs> that political action is then negotiated and it's negotiated not just in text, but also in the actual interpretation of that image and how it's being used and appropriated. And that's what we, we try to trace. But it's of course also raised the question, well, that's just in a sense one, it's one very important one, one that became iconic and also became emblematic of the entire refugee crisis. But, but as Lena will probably say more about, we wanted to ask the question, what if we zoom out and look at the entire landscape um, with, with the caveats that we have in the article of, of, of we never give the entire <laughs> visual landscape that we, we, we are in, what happens to that analysis? Thank you. I, I, I think that that's, I mean, just to follow on from what Becca, what Becca is saying, I mean, I think that, that, that the iconic image is often, I mean, it's one that set itself aside in some way from the you know, wealth of images that surround us. So there's also, I think even though this is not sort of, I haven't sat down with, you know, 200 iconic images and compared them to, you know, the set of images that they could have been, you know, in contact with. But I think there will be sort of a tendency to, around the iconic image, that it does something that is more extreme or that it puts, you know, things to the forefront. So in that sense, it, you know, it was interesting for us to go out and look at this much larger number of images that were, you know, that we coded more than 900 images that were collected at four different points in time from October 2013 uh, until the end of, of October 2015. So, you, you know, about a month uh, after uh, after Alan Kurdi uh, was uh, was found dead. So, so because I think it gives us a sense also of the extent to which that the Alan Kurdi image, you know, was unusual. Uh, I mean, it was the only it was the image that we found in our material that showed you know, a visible body uh, of a of a refugee that uh, that had that had died. So so you do get sort of a you, you know I think you get a more systematic sense of the ways in which that iconic images relate to a larger number. Um, I think also that that this kind of study also kind of enables us to ask whether we would potentially see the images that came before the iconic image of Kurdi differently. You know, once we have the image of Kurdi. So, so there's something here about you know, how a later iconic image in this case, for example, might make the photos, for example, of caskets uh, of, of people who drowned in 2013, you know, it was one of the, the, the first big accident uh, around Lampedusa, that we actually see them differently because we have an iconic image where we can actually see, you know, the dead refugee child. That that actually also does something to transform it. So this this I think also goes to sort of what's the you know what's the what's the broader theorization that we have of re relations between images if we're looking at them over time uh, and if we're looking at them not exclusively as kind of singular objects of observation, uh, but also of relations uh, between them. A final thing on, on the iconic images, and you're mentioning Harriman and Lukaitis, uh, uh, Roland, uh, and their you know, influential definition. And, and they, 
as you're saying, I mean, they have a, a, a very long time before images become iconic, at least if we're looking at the, you know, the images that they're working with. Um, and I think this is also, you know, a question that we've got uh, around the Alan Curdy image. Uh, if this is an instant icon and, and you know, it might uh, get a lot of attention at a very, you know, very quickly, very short period in time, but then also disappear. Um, and I think if we're talking about visual politics in general, I think it is possible. It is possible that we would see more of these sort of instant icons that will have this kind of, you know, status. But I think if we're looking to Alan Curdy and see how frequently, you know, repeated references and and also you know reprinting of of uh, of the images of Alan Curdy, uh, how they still take place. I think Alan Curdy seems at least you know sort of. Five and a half years after uh, it was uh, it was shot, it, it seems to me to have you know a good chance of actually becoming you know an old fashioned iconic image that will also stand out uh, you know ten years uh, ten years after uh, it was first produced. Mm -hmm. I think one thing and like sort of that's maybe sort of opening up one question uh, around is is some some of the people who are engaged in, in these debates have a sort of pessimistic view of instant icons that they will give the sort of more superficial kind of form of politics where we don't dwell sufficiently uh, on an image and it, 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 you know discuss you know what are the politics that it should enable did enable and so on um, and I can certainly see that you know understand the sort of the, the 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 logic behind you know those arguments, but I think also there is a more broader question, which is whether the politics itself is transforming. Right. So so that these are the social media engagement, and I know Rebecca, you worked a lot more on social media than I have. That that maybe it's a different form of politics that we need to understand. So so that is that there might be actually something you know powerful involved in how you know images can be picked up and circulated and reach you know through social media a much much bigger audience than images would do even just you know fifteen years ago. Yeah, and if I just on on that. One of the sort of puzzling findings, if I can use that word, on the Curdy image is the fact that it's at the same time becomes um, a reference for uh, opening up uh, Europe to the to refugees. So it becomes the, sort of the image of Wir schaffen das, as, as Angela Merkel would say. So we, we would have a welcoming policy in Europe for refugees um, to avoid another Kurdi. But also the opposite position. This very same ref icon becomes a reference for closing the borders, for avoiding uh, anyone ever crossing the Mediterranean, uh, drowning on, on the way. So, so we can see opposite policies being legitimized with reference to this iconic image with arguably the same argument, we want to avoid another Kurdi. And this, is part of sort of the background as well for or the motivation I think for asking well what can we can we somehow dig deeper into that puzzling if 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 simple uh, fact that there's this disconnect uh, in the emotional register and the policies made uh, with direct reference to this iconic image. I think you. You're both making, of course, a very, very convincing argument about the importance of icons, the link to social media and all, but at the same time, both in the article and in your kind of statements here, you make the case for the need to zoom out, as I think uh, Rebecca says, uh, or as Lena says, to go away from single images to look at larger patterns of how these larger visual, visual patterns have framed uh, refugee policies rather than just a singular event of, of one particular image. And to do so, you, you embark on uh, a fairly unusual, certainly for international relations, kind of methodological setup in the sense that you're using discourse analysis, which has been uh, used uh, in the past successfully in international relations. And of course, Lene has written the definitive book really on, on discourse analysis as a method to study security in international politics. But you also employ content analysis, a quantitative method. And it's, it's quite unusual for scholars to combine 
discourse analysis with content analysis in the sense that one requires different methodological skills, you know, qualitative versus quantitative skills. Often these methods are also associated with fairly hostile epistemological debates in the sense that discourse analysis is, is sort of linked to post-structuralism, to post-positivist kind of approaches, whereas content analysis is often linked to positivism, to more scientific approaches. So this combination is unusual. So I'm wondering if you can maybe say a little bit more of how you went about it, whether you accounted difficulties, whether these difficulties were of a technical nature in terms of uh, needing the skills to do, whether you had, uh, you know, scholars being worried about the combination and sort of give, give us a bit of a sense maybe of how you embarked on that and what, what you encountered as you did so. I can I can start up then Rebecca can uh, can can you you, you can follow up Rebecca yeah uh, I think it was a, a I think the the combination of those two methods was I think also you know in large part uh, due to Katrina's work um, who was the third author and, and like I mentioned uh, you know, early on uh, you know her master's thesis was you know used. Uh, visual discourse analysis and, and content coding and on a much smaller number of, of images. So she also brought in a, a more of a methodological capacity to, to do more quantitative form of analysis uh, than, uh, than, than, than I had. Um, so I think I could say at least for my, for my part, it, it also started out as an interesting experiment. And it, so what happens if we do this? You know, like you're saying, Roland, it's it's methods that would not normally be, you know, combined. Um, but also, there were a few, you know, also post-structuralist or kind of broadly speaking scholars. You know, your work on the Australian refugee crisis visualization, where you also do some coding. Uh, David Campbell's analysis of of the Fuhr from 2007, where he says, you know, he does a simple content analysis uh, of uh, of of the images that have been used. Uh, in 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 the Guardian, uh, and there was also an article by Chris Methman, uh, which is about climate refugees. that was published in 2014 in International uh, Political Sociology, where he, com he combines visual discourse analysis uh, also with a uh, with a content coding. So there were a couple of of uh, front runners <laughs> that we were in, inspired of as well, and and then I think it, it was a sort of you know, like Rebecca was saying, it also, I think the two methods speak to two different phenomenologically ways of approaching images. So, you know, the, the iconic images, both the, the specific icons, but also what we would call generic iconic uh, images, which is a motif, you know, the, the crowded boat uh, in, in, in terms of, of, you know, visualizations of boat refugees is, uh, is, is one example. They stand out, right? So the, these would be the things that we would be able to remember. And in some ways they become sort of visual nodal points and, and potentially also visual kind of nodal points for, for policy making when you can hear, you know, politicians refer to particular. <laughs> um, but then there's also, you, you know, the broader number of images that we confront. Right. So, 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 so in that sense, you could sort of there are all of the images that we potentially don't really pay attention to, but which might actually also do something to frame a phenomenon. So let's just say hypothetically that there's one Alan Purdy image, and and then there are two million images that just show visualized you know news stories about the European refugee crisis without showing any uh, human beings. Right. Just showing, you know, abandoned boats, for example, the harbor fronts or fences. So that does something then at a, at a you know, at a, at, a, at a much bigger level to depersonalize, you know, the phenomenon. So I think that 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 the the, the two the two methods actually do something in terms of capturing potentially different aspects of the way in which that you know images frame the the political phenomena. That are brought to uh, that are brought to us, yeah. and just to follow follow up on that, um, it's it, as as Lena was saying. We hope at least the reader will find it adds depth and a kind of a almost also sort of <laughs> it turns on itself in, in in the article because you shift gear the moment you go from from qualitative to quantitative or the other way around, but it is still the same phenomenon we're looking at, and so it adds a sort of.
it questions our own um, perceptions and, 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 and what we experience when we, when we see the crisis. But it also, um, I think, involved concretely a lot of time sitting with these images. And they are quite um, harsh. Uh, so even those that are not showing dead people, it, 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 in terms of the actual coding, not just methodological questions of how to count and what we count and what we see um, was something we, we needed to discuss. For instance, when we see a, a big boat, can we actually say, say these are women or are they men? So all these coding um, questions that we had also raised a number of really interesting um, ethical questions in terms of, 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 of representation and re-representations of these uh, images that, um, that of course, I think the qualitative dimension of the visual turn has always been very interested in, but maybe not in the same way. And so I think there are, there's really potential, not just mythologically and theoretically, but also ethically, of, of, of having conversations between these different approaches because they do produce sometimes complementary, sometimes contradictory findings, but they also push each other to think, I think to reflect on their own limits. And I think that that's also, well, within the space of the article, what we hopefully can at least try to begin to have a conversation about uh, because because I, I think it's it's crucial that we do engage more in this kind of um, experimental, um, more explorative uh, approaches, um, as you also have been doing for a long time, Roland. And 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 it's it's something we really appreciate because it it it, it does add something. I think you've done a fantastic job with combining these two methods. And as you say in the article, it's the first study that actually uses a high number of images like you do like this is quite unusual to 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 survey a uh, number of images in the hundreds and and combine that with a more micro uh, analysis of a discourse analysis and one of the big questions of course when doing that is is what exactly can you tell from that you know what in particular what what can you say about the impact of images and in in sort of the popular perceptions of course there's been a lot of talk and, and writing about the extent to which the media coverage and Alan Curtis photo in particular has led to policy changes uh, across Europe and and Rebecca you said sort of Merkel's uh, shift uh, wir schaffen das that you know mm -hmm. sort of a change in, in 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 refugee policy from a hostile policy to one that embraces policies uh, more favorable of refugees but you both say in your article that you're quite skeptical about making causal arguments, about making the argument that an image causes certain events, whether it's a change in policy, whether it's something else, and you make more of an argument for exploring the conditions of possibility, for, for sort of showing how, how images frame policies and lead policies in certain ways. Uh, I would be fascinated to hear sort of from you about the difference of these, of, of your, your skepticism of causal analysis and what exactly you can say about the impact of images through the kind of methods you're employing and, and what the limits and the potentials of the limits are of that uh, to, to tell us about the impact of images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, a wonderful question that, that has been a, a real driver in our in our conversation throughout the, the years we've been dealing with this and leaning for, for a long, long, longer time on the visual. Um, it is exactly that underlying question, uh, which I think is also the, the, the big so what. <laughs> so, so if you're not interested in visuals and looking at, at, at this conversation from the outside, uh, that is the question, the question you're going to ask. And it's, it's a complex answer we, we will have to give, but it's hopefully also one that, that is more sophisticated um, as this, this interest in, in the visual grows, because um, in, in this particular article, we found a lot of ambiguity. And we, we, so we, we, have, we have chosen these four events, major uh, drowning events or major uh, turning events in, in the refugee crisis, and then zoomed in on, on those actually and, and looked at the, the, the images before and after those events and, 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 and coded them in, in, in the quantitative part of it. Um, and there is no clear pattern in the sense that we have both appeals to, to, to refugee, to humanitarianism, light or, or less light, and to some more sort of strict border control. And it isn't a clear 
uh, trajectory. So you, you, you can have one event that sort of seems to appeal to one side of the story, in one kind of politics, and the other one in the other. And uh, personally, I, th I find that um, in and of itself interesting because um, I used to work uh, in, in the foreign ministry for, for, a, uh, uh, for a year in, in uh, just when the crisis was, was, was quite explosive. Um, and of course, diplomats and leaders read these newspapers um, too and react and respond to these images. But what do they make of them? And part of the coding is in a sense, I wouldn't say to put it, put ourselves in their place, but to, to ask that question systematically. And what they see is not, it's not obvious. It's not obvious what to make of these quite different images of many people in a boat, <laughs> uh, cap, uh, boat boats that have turned over, um, people fighting for their lives. It, with all the tragedy and all the violence of those images, there are, they actually raise more questions than answers uh, when we begin even also in the quantitative analysis. So I wouldn't say that I had the presumption that the quantitative analysis would give us <laughs> clear numbers. They do give us numbers, but those numbers do not in, in and of themselves explain the politics. And I'm gonna hand it over to Liam, who's probably gonna give a more sophisticated answer to your question about the impact of images. Like Rebecca said, that's been, you know, the, the causal question has been probably the question uh, that's been on the agenda uh, mm -hmm. in our discussion. And, and I think in part, it's the sort of skepticism that came out of the CNN literature, that it just was hard to find a simple causal effect. If by causality, we meaning, you know, tragedy or something happens, and then you see images, and then you see a shift in policy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a sort of that that's that's part of the the broader you know sort of the broader backdrop to to uh, to our you know conditions of possi possibility. I think if I can take it to, you know taking continuing on what Rebecca was saying about this study, I mean we the analysis of of EU policy making and discourse uh, that had been done by scholars it, you know working it, working on those topics have and rightly so pointed out you know how the EU's discourse and policy is a sort of light humanitarianism, and that means also that both that discursively and in terms of policies it can sort of it has a kind of ambiguity or a maneuverability between a more human, genuine humanitarian and a border control, uh, you know, discourse and policy. So in that sense, that's also, you know, why the sort of the, the key kind of term that we found in our initial discourse analysis of the documents that were put out by the EU uh, from 2013 to 2015, that the key, you know, representation was one of strategy, you know, and like I was saying you know, earlier on in terms of Alan Curdy, tragedy can be constituted as both the need to intervene as a humanitarian, this is something we must prevent uh, by opening the borders, but tragedy can also you know, be constituted as a need to prevent it, mobility to happen in the first place. And particularly when you're dealing with children who aren't making that decision themselves. So in that sense, it, you know, tragedy is very, politically polysemic, <laughs> if you like. And, and in that sense, the image of Kurdi is also, I mean, we can understand how that became politically polysemic because strategy actually has that capacity uh, to be you know, articulated uh, to diff into different policy discourses. So I think in that sense, what we found both in the individual discourse analysis and in, in, in the quantitative content analysis was actually that there were that same ambiguity. You know, we found five you know, key motifs in the visual discourse analysis, two that were pointing more in a border control uh, direction, two that were more in a humanitarian direction, and one that we argued which is generally ambiguous in terms of, of how it was situated. But even the ones that were pointing more in one direction had ambiguity in them. You know, that's the sort of the claim of the visual discourse analysis. And in the content uh, analysis, we found that, it, that there were some we coded for eight different variables. Uh, and for seven of them, 
there were sort of statistically significant you know, differences across time, but they did not add up in a systematic way. So the point is also we could have found something differently. So had we found, say, that you know, the visual representation uh, moves much more dramatically uh, in support of a humanitarian you know, representation, then we could have argued that would have been a broader, uh, you know, a much stronger pressure uh, from the visual discourse to act in a more humanitarian or in a more border control sort of way. So, in, so, so, so I think that, that it's important also to say things could have been different. We could have found a different result and we could have argued that there would have been more of a pressure from the visual representation uh, than, than, than were the case. The final thing that I, that I wanted to say is, is, is also that this is both the humanitarian and, and strategy and border uh, politics and, is that both of those representation uh, tend to represent uh, you know, the refugee either as a threat or as somebody in need of assistance. So there was a lack of images, I would say, sort of that would show refugees in a more positive agentic capacity. Like, so this is also about, you know, we're looking at what do we learn from this in terms of the broader politics is that these discourses also, you know, both of them actually also frame the phenomenon in such a way where refugees don't become, you know, equal political uh, subjects that could be engaged uh, in, in policy making uh, potentially you know, in this uh, in this area. So, so I think in 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 that sense, it's conditions of possibility. But hopefully, it's more fine grained conditions of possibility than than we knew when we were setting out. Uh, I think certainly the, the, the sort of the details of the ambiguity and the way in which that that these sort of two discourses did not add up, uh, you know, in 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 such a clear way as they could have had was something that was. You know, that seemed that, that was to me at least that was an interesting discovery. Mm -hmm. That is obviously one of the key things, yes, you sort of explore this level of ambiguity and the extent to which, uh, as uh, Rebecca said, is, it, it opened up more questions than what you had at the beginning. Uh, and of course, there's questions that probably there are outside of the scope of your of your essay, for instance, the extent to which different national, nations might have had different visual patterns or different ideologically motivated newspapers might have portrayed it differently. But one of the interesting things is you still came up with, or you still found this notion of tragedy as the kind of, uh, as the, 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 the anchor in which the visual and the verbal, and that's another thing, the relationship between visual and verbal, and tragedy was sort of anchored around, around this coverage. And you also talk about the extent to which this focus, visual, verbal focus on tragedy uh, opened up possibilities, but also closed some. So you talk, for instance, about, about how the, the visual framing of the crisis as, as a tragedy really didn't focus on why refugees kind of left in the first place. So it sort of excluded certain uh, questions. It excluded, as you say, uh, a focus on, on smugglers, you know, so there's certain elements that were excluded from the rep visual representation of tragedies and others were foregrounded. Uh, would you like to say a bit more about sort of the political significance of that, of that finding that you've uh, discovered? Um, I could say two lines and we'll see what Lena says. Uh, the the interesting um, the interesting element of the tragedy discourse and, and visualization of tragedy is that it's it's both extremely political and it, it depoliticizes as well. It, it because it if something is a tragedy, it has almost that sort of Greek <laughs> fate that it it was just it just happened. It happened and it was out of our control. And so the, uh, the underlying questions about why, as, as you were saying, why the refugee came and what role the EU or individual countries or leaders might, might play in, in even constituting that refugee crisis in the first place disappear because the tragedy is beyond your, your control. At the same time, it invites you probably, at least in some of the uh, uh, photos we've analyzed, to some kind of action, but it's, it becomes a, uh, something you react to, but not something you produce uh, yourself, because then you, then it would be something you had uh, sort of a deliberate or at least 
a responsibility for. So I think it's in that sense, it does something, it produces a particular political arena for action, but it also silences other pro other issues and other sort of complications. Um, and I mean, anyone who's followed the refugee crisis knows that it's not a refugee crisis, right? It is, it is a war and, it, it, and there were possibilities before that war became a war for other positions of, of EU member states and of, of course of, of, a, of a longer term involvement of, of Europe in, in that area. So, um, so all those questions are not raised in those photos, even though of course they're, they're deeply implicated in the production of those. So I think that's at least part of, of why the strategy discourse and visualization is so incredibly important for us to understand how policy, policy is made and not made. Thank you, Rebecca. Can I have a quick follow-up mm -hmm. maybe to that one since, since Rebecca just said that. Uh, that's a tricky question. I'm not sure you know, there's a clear answer, but what would it be that a focus on the visual can help us understand in this policy framing that a focus on the verbal cannot? In some sense, what's the added value of focusing on the visual? Uh, uh, is there something different about how the crisis was framed or the war was framed visually than if it were just framed verbally? So sort of what's, what's that relationship between the visual and the verbal in, in, in this process? So, yeah, um, that's, that is a great question. And I think there is a, a real difference. It's also constituted in, in and through discourse. So the very way in which I was surprised, to be honest, of how much images were referred to as doing something. So beyond the question of whether they do something, they are seen as being doing something by leaders themselves. And so part of the very constitution of the response becomes a, a, a direct uh, reference, not just to Curdy, but to these images. We want to avoid these images from coming. So the images always come to have an agency in and of themselves. And, and, and in that sense, um, they, they are, they are uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say they had, they had agency, but they, they become constituted as something that, that do politics and that do them in a different route. So the images are seen to, to, to have a, a direct emotional effect. And they also, and I think we, should, we, we saw that time and again, they also um, somehow transgress the, the public and the private, the intimate and the personal uh, and the political. And that seems to be something we can maybe uh, do more work on in the future because it does also something very interesting politically. If an image sort of has the effect of of making you from a political leader to a father, for instance, you you react to the Kurdi image as a father, then it also uh, moves the political agenda into something that's much more personal and familiar uh, than than say a an EU uh, meeting of, of uh, ministers of interior where we, we make rational politics. So it has that effect, at least the way we've seen, seen it, that it, it brings us the emotional register into much, much more into the forefront. If I can just add on quickly to that, and of course, you know, the work that, that, that you, Emma Hutchinson has done, you mm -hmm. know, on, on emotions uh, in yeah. I is, is terribly important. And I think there's really, you know, by talking about the visual turn and there's also talk about the emotional turn and, and those two turns have a clear interface and you've, you've been at the forefront of that, that as well. I think if I could just say something, two quick things because on, on both on, you know, what's not there. And I think it would be interesting to expand our study um, of the visualization of the refugee crisis and then saying, you know, how is it then that, you know, the war is in Syria, you know, but also in other places, how were they visualized at the same time, right? You know, there's a sort of, these images that we have selected have been from stories that were about migration and refugees, like we were using search terms to identify potential stories. But there's also a visualization going on of, 
you know, of the war in Syria, just to focus on that. So what would be, you know, what would be the relationship between stories that were selected because they were specifically about the Syrian war uh, and those of the refugee crisis? So, so that would be a way of expanding and then saying, you know, you know, the absence of a visualization of why refugees arrived might actually also potentially be happening in other stories. And readers, for example, of online newspapers might, you know, read those stories, uh, you know, after, you know, after one another. So, so this is also kind of you sort of we're looking at photographs, which, you know, of course, has is a snapshot, right? And 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 in that sense, you, you know, you can imbue a narrative to a photograph, but it is itself also, you know, with that sort of epistem epistemic limitations that uh, it shows one particular uh, moment. I think finally on the smuggler, um, I think as we say in the article, that could possibly have happened. Um, I think if photojournalists had, in the material that we studied, had, you know, done more to, you know, follow smugglers and, and done, you, you know, stories uh, that were tracing that, or if somebody, some smuggler had been apprehended and that photo uh, of, 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 the, of, of the smuggler had become iconic. So I think it could have happened, but we did not, uh, we did not see that visualization. And I think it also potentially raises some ambiguity because a lot is invested in the discourse uh, uh, from the side of the EU in making the smuggler, you know, the culprit of why this is happening. So it's a lot about fighting the smuggler. And, and but the smuggler, uh, without being an expert on migration politics, is also a complicated figure. You now, of course, we have the sort of, you know, terrible, you know, stories about uh, you know, smugglers that are, you know, abusing, you know, refugees and abandoning, you know, in, in water and, you know, out at sea and so on. Uh, but, in, in, you know, as discussions over, you know, the role of Alan Kurdi father, whether he was actually involved in, you know, helping more refugees to get across and so on, you know, charges that were then, I think Rebecca can remember that better perhaps, but were ultimately, you know, found uh, not to hold up. Uh, after scrutiny, but I think it illustrates <clears throat> that the smuggler is in, in, in a lot of cases actually a more complicated figure, you know, enabling, you know, mobility as well. So in that sense, it might actually also be hard to come up with a strong visualization of the smuggler. Um, so, so, so that was just reflections on, you know, following on from, from what you were saying. Laura. I was wondering, Martin, do we have time for sort of a final? A final, of yeah, a final item and then perhaps, yeah. Maybe we'll sure. do. Look, the, 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 the final point, the question I have or sort of a point I thought we could discuss is we were sort of initially zooming out from, from icons to, to the larger visual patterns that frame the refugee crisis. And I was wondering if we can zoom out even further and sort of look a little bit at what are the larger implications of, of your study for those of us who study the role of the visual in international politics, those of us who study refugees, sort of where do you see that research going? And can you say a couple of words, maybe what we can learn from your article that us who do work on this can, can take? Where do you see sort of the next challenges? You, you, at the end of your article, you, you mentioned questions of color and the color framing of issues. So where do you see some of the big sort of challenges that, that, we, can, that we need to address? I, I, I think there are a number. Thank you, Roland. I mean, I, I would, I, I would be really, I really hope that there would be other, you know, students and scholars who would be inspired to try the combination of the two methods that we do and, and see if, if, you know, what happens if you're looking at it in a different, uh, at a different theme, you know, that might also actually have a more diverse representation. You know, we found the images that we found were still some that, you know, were sort of thematically quite related. But if we're looking to, for example, you know, the way that COVID, the COVID pandemic is visualized, I think there's much more range of, of themes that are, that are visual that the pandemic is visualized through. So I think for me, I would hope that there would be more you know studies that would try to use this combination of methods. Uh, one final thing that I the final thing that I wanted to 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 end on is that I would be really interested for Rebecca and I to continue our collaboration and then you, you know do systematic studies of how those who make policies 
how they respond to images and, and you know, what they think about them and, and, and you know, what is it actually, you know, in the sort of visual methodology uh, literature sort of called audiencing, which is usually often the audience are, you know, the, uh, you know, the general public, uh, but there's also audience which is an expert audience in terms of policymakers and diplomats. And yeah, and just to follow up on that, uh, I'd love to, <laughs> if we could, um, if we could also make use of the, the knowledge, we do know that visuals are used within the UN Security Council. It's used across the board in terms of, of, of constituting uh, uh, solutions or, or, or answers. So, so that would be an interesting avenue to explore. How, how do images get constituted in the, in the decision-making <laughs> arenas as something that produce or should produce particular uh, answers, how it's used strategically, but also um, to legitimize um, uh, decisions. But I'd also love to, and this is something we're doing right now, um, to trace how this works at the level of social media. So these are um, online newspapers in our study here, but um, the obvious um, next step would be to, to try to see how, for instance, visuals of refugees circulate uh, on social media and how they help constitute a particular discourse on, say, Instagram, Facebook, and, and the di different platforms, and what, it, what the affordances of those pla platforms do to the both the iconic and the and the more general um, status of those images. I think we know that these social media platforms are much more based. I mean, they depend on images. So in that sense. Uh, this is bound to do something uh, to our analysis. So this is something we'll definitely do in the future. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, all three, for a fascinating discussion that has ranged widely from icons to causality to tragedy to complementary methodologies and, and much, much else. And I really hope our viewers uh, have enjoyed this as, as much as I have. Again, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you.